Good evening and welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News, where we discuss the important events that would have taken place in Guyana over the past week or so. And as the norm, we have a packed agenda of issues that are worthy of discussions. I want to begin by welcoming our viewers who are joining us on television from West Coast Barbies, Region 5. Welcome to another program of issues in the news. To our viewers who are joining us on television on, in Region 6, East Barbies, and along the Quarantine Coast, welcome to another program of issues in the news. And to our listeners and viewers who are joining us on Freedom Radio, Rob Street, Georgetown, welcome to another program of issues in the news. And last but not least, to the thousands of you who are joining us across the length and breadth of Guyana on Facebook Live, who are joining us from across the Caribbean, who are joining us from North America, Europe, Asia, and further afield, welcome to another program of Issues in the News. And as I would normally say, please press that share button on your phone, press that share button on your iPad, on your computer, on your laptop, on your PC, press that share button so that as many of your friends and followers can join in tonight's discussion. And we already have hundreds of you logging on here, Garji Sita Ram, Chris Thakur Pasad, Malcolm Bihari, Suresh Muklal, uh, Castleton Williams, Musa Ram Das, Asgar Isuf, Keith Adams, Bansi, Robert Ram Roop, Sally Jones, Frank Badrina Ryan, and so many of you welcome once again. And please, I would like to engage you. So if you want me to discuss a particular topic, please, if you want me to answer a particular question, let's have it in the uh, comments column and I will engage. So please press that share button on your phone, press that share button on your iPad, press that share button on your television, on your computer, so that as many of your friends and followers can join with us in tonight's discussion. I want to begin tonight by recognizing uh, that today we laid to rest and paid our final respects to an iconic son of Guyana, an iconic leader of the People's Progressive Party, and a public administrator par excellence in the form of Dr. Roger Luncheon. Of course, he was a medical doctor uh, from all indications of tremendous capabilities and was a brilliant man. I had the privilege I had the honor of working with him in cabinet on a number of projects, and I was always amazed at his clarity of thought, his towering intellect, and his facility with language. Uh, Roger Luncheon served the people of this country with great distinction, holding some of the most powerful positions in Guyana. He was head of the Presidential Secretariat for 23 successive years. That by itself is a record. He was secretary to the cabinet for 23 successive years. He was secretary to the defense board for 23 successive years, all being posts that he held more than anyone else, longer than anyone else in independent Guyana. Roger Luncheon, you know, in a society where there is this allegation that Afro-Guyanese are marginalized by and in the PPP, I want to say without any doubt whatsoever that Roger Luncheon and Afro-Guyanese wielded as much power as any other leader in the PPP and wielded more power than most the presidents under whom he served, constitutionally and theoretically, would have enjoyed a greater plenitude of power than Roger Luncheon 
by virtue of the presidency. But practically and pragmatically, Luncheon executed the decisions of the government, or he saw the execution of the decisions of the government, and he saw the execution of the decisions of the president as head of the presidential secretariat and as secretary to cabinet. And Luncheon contributed significantly in an incomparable way to the national defense strategy and policy of this country in his capacity as secretary to the defense board and chairman of the National Intelligence Agency. He understood our territorial sovereignty. He understood the challenges that we faced in that regard. He understood internal national security. He understood, as I said in my speech, uh, uh, in paying tribute to him at Camp Angana last Sunday. He understood the physiology, the sociology, the politics, and the behavioral tendencies of the Guyana Defense Force more than any. In the difficult times when we had a crime spree and where sections of our country were overtaken by marauding criminal gangs. It was Dr. Roger Luncheon who was at the center of the making of crucial decisions that determined whether this country would have erupted into violence and become a failed state or continue in a trajectory of nationhood and civility. Those were the type of decisions that Roger Luncheon participated in making. Difficult decisions, virtually impossible decisions, decisions that determined the fate of this country. Luncheon was at the helm, along with the presidents under whom he served, in making and articulating those decisions. And that's why I was very happy that the General Secretary and Vice President Bharat Jagdeo spoke and delved into these matters today at the funeral ceremony of Dr. Luncheon. Luncheon was a workaholic. He worked and he worked and he worked all hours in the office of the President and when that task was not completed, he took it home and he continued working. I remember sitting with him for days, working on initiatives such as the Linden Commission of Inquiry, the Walter Rodney Commission of Inquiry. It is Roger Luncheon, who, along with your, my, myself, who established institutions like SOKU. And Roger Luncheon was instrumental in guiding a minority government along very, very um, tumultuous waters when between the period of 2011 to 2015, when the joint opposition used their one-seat majority to cut national budgets and vote down important legislation that caused us to be sanctioned by the international community because we could not have uh, uh, discharged our obligations under the AML CFT protocols and international requirements. It was Luncheon who headed a national task force on anti-money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism. And there, is so, there are so many more important decisions that Luncheon made as chairman of all the cabinet subcommittees. He literally ran government literally ran the governments of the PPP. So I wanted to say to those who like to malign the PPP and engage in the type of rhetoric about racism in the PPP that Roger Luncheon wielded perhaps more power than anyone in the People's Progressive Party, successive governments. And that is why they attempted to denigrate him in their statement when he died. 
AP and new AFC issued a statement that was a disgrace, an, an utter disgrace for a man who served this country with distinction. Those would recall, those of you looking would recall that they came to arrest him while he was on a wheelchair at the leader of the opposition office and take him down to Soku. I was present. I was his lawyer. I accompanied him to Soku. This is a man who formed Soku. He appointed, he and I went through the names of the officers who were appointed to Soku. And those very officers came to arrest him. They could have taken the statement from him right there in the leader of the opposition office, but they were given political directions. Sidney James should hang his head in shame. As Dr. Roger Luncheon recommended that Sidney Jean, James be appointed the head of SOKU. There's a lot more we will have to say about Dr. Luncheon. A lot more will have to be said about Dr. Luncheon and the instrumental role that he played and the number of people whose lives he touched every Saturday. Starting from about one, he would see members of the public from across this country and engage them in all types of matters. Land matter, court matters, personal matters, medical matters. Luncheon was a man of all seasons. I think somebody described him like that today. Today he was given a state funeral and nothing is more deserving. The army came out in all their glory to pay tribute to a man who helped shape and groomed and evolved that army into the place that it is. And luncheon must be saluted and we saluted him today and we gave him the best send off that we possibly could have done as a political party and as a government. Luncheon deserved no less. So I have seen in the public domain questions being raised about the extension of Mr. Clifton Hickins' acting appointment in the office of Commissioner of Police. The leader of the opposition contends that the appointment is unlawful according to him. The office of the Commissioner of Police can only enjoy an extension if the holder of that office enjoys a substantive appointment. That, I understand, is the gravamen of his claim. It is my considered and respectful view that there is nothing in the Constitution or in any other law which confines the extension of tenure of the holder of that office to substantive appointees only. In my considered and respectful view, the holder of that office, whether acting or substantively, enjoys all the powers, all the facilities, and all the privileges of that office. Significantly, the method of appointment to the substantive post and to the acting post is identical. Both requires meaningful consultation with the leader of the opposition. 
in my respectful view, logically it follows that if the appointment process is the same, then the disappointment process will be the same, and the Constitution so prescribes. And if the holder of that office, whether substantively or by virtue of an acting appointment, can be extended, then I see no reason and no principle which confines that extension only to the, a substantive appointee and not an acting appointee. There is nothing in the Constitution that makes that distinction. I wish to confirm in my humble and respectful view that His Excellency the President complied with the Constitution and complied with the laws in relation to the extension of Mr. Hickin's acting tenure beyond his age of retirement. Another criticism I saw emanated from Mr. Clinton Conway. His argumentation is different from that of the opposition leader. He argues that the Constitution does not permit an extension to the office of the Commissioner of Police, period, either to a, in relation to a substantive holder or in relation to an acting holder. He is perfectly correct. The Constitution itself does not provide for an extension either for the Commissioner of Police substantive or to a Commissioner of Police acting. Another piece of legislation does. It is called the, Con the Constitution Prescribed Matters Act, Chapter 27, colon 12, Act number 21 of 1967. And this piece of legislation permits for the president to inter alia extend the tenure of a commissioner of police beyond his retirement age, provided that the president receives a recommendation from the Police Service Commission to that effect. And the president has so received a recommendation from the Police Service Commission. As I said, the, acting, the appointment process is the same for both the acting and the substantive. Quickly, let me read it quickly. The Commissioner of Police and every other dep and every deputy commissioner of police shall be appointed by the president, acting after meaningful consultation with the leader of the opposition and the chairperson of the police. Service Commission after the chairperson has consulted with the other members of the commission. That is how the Commissioner of Police is appointed. If the office of the Commissioner of Police is vacant or if the holder thereof is for any reason unable to act, a person may be appointed to act in that office and the provisions of the preceding paragraph shall apply to such an appointment as they apply to the appointment of a person to hold the office. So whether it's acting or substantive, the same procedure applies. The president must meaningfully consult with the leader of the opposition 
and must act upon the recommendation of the Police Service Commission, who must have the support, the Chairman of the Police Service Commission, who must have the support of the, the other members of the Commission. The, the extension is in similar language under the Constitution Prescribed Matters Act, Chapter 27, colon 12. So to Mr. Conway, the Constitution doesn't provide for the extension, but another piece of legislation does. So I hope that I have put those two matters to rest, both the contention of the leader of the opposition and the contention of Mr. Clinton Conway. And let me conclude by saying that in my considered view, I reiterate that His Excellency the President complied with both the Constitution and the Constitution Prescribed Matters Act, Chapter 27, colon 12, when he extended the tenure of Mr. Clifton Hicken to continue to act in office after he would have reached the age of 55 years old. The Commission of Inquiry into the Madia Dorms Fire begun its work today. The terms of reference were published in the official gazette and is there for all to read. I find it very strange that members of the media are still of the view that the, the terms of reference have not been published when it was duly published in the official gazette, which is a publication that is done online as well as by hard, hard copies. So members of the media, the terms, and, uh, terms of reference of the COI have been published and are on the Gazette online and you can pick up a hard copy as well. The seat of the Commission of Inquiry is 95 Middle Street, North Cummingsburg, Georgetown. That's the official seat of the COI. That's the very premises that the COI into the elections of 2020 were conducted. The COI, of course, under the terms of reference and under the Commission of Inquiries Act, shall determine its process and procedure. So they may or may not hold hearings at Madia. They may or may not hold hearings in other parts of Guyana. That's a matter for them to determine. But the official seat of the commission will be at that office, and the secretariat of the commission will be located there. The Judicial Service Commission has indicated in an article published in the Stabrook News last Sunday that it will advertise the vacancies existing in the judiciary and by extension the magistracy. That is a decision that is welcomed. I have oftentimes remarked that the Judicial Service Commission like every other state agency, is funded from public monies and is expected to act accountably and transparently. In the same way that the executive is held to a high standard in respect of accountability, and transparency in the same way that the legislature is held to a high standard in terms of transparency and accountability and in the same way 
that every other state agency funded by public monies are held to a standard of accountability and transparency, the judiciary, both financially and functionally, ought to be held to similar standards. Gone are the days when there is any secret cow in our society. The democratization across the globe no longer permits that. The Constitution speaks to the qualifications for judges. It says anyone who has seven years of standing qualifies to be a judge of the High Court at least. So on what basis can persons be selected for appointments by a few people. It means that I can be qualified, but I don't meet the subjective invitation of those wielding the power to recommend appointments. And that is discriminatory against me. And I'm using myself as just an example. The Constitution itself prevents discrimination of any form or type. So from the moment you have a process whereby one or two persons invite potential applicants to apply, thereby depriving others who are equally qualified the opportunity to apply, because only those who are invited can apply, then it is discriminatory against those who are not invited but are qualified. And that used to be the traditional position. But as I said, the world has changed. And I'm happy that this change is being embraced by the judiciary. And once the application is public, then hopefully we will get in applications from persons outside of Guyana. The intention is not to confine applicants to Guyanese, but to invite the Commonwealth, to invite the Caribbean, to extend the applications to all and sundry who are qualified and who desire to be part of the Guyana's, Guyana's judiciary. So this process, augurs, this approach, augurs well, and hopefully also when persons are being assessed for promotion or elevation, then performance must form part of the assessment criteria. I have often remarked that it is unfortunate that we have a law which mandates judges to write their decisions after the conclusion of a case within a prescribed time. And for a report to be prepared by the judiciary and laid in the National Assembly in respect of their compliance with that law, 
and the law has been observed in the breach. That can't be something that a, an institution like the judiciary can be proud of. After all, it is the judiciary that is the fundamental pillar of the rule of law. And if the judiciary is perceived as not complying with the law, then we will have problems. So, at least we are moving in the right direction based upon the sentiments I read expressed in that article. The other issue relating to this is that what, while I recognize that there has been a long hiatus between the last, between the Judicial Service Commission that expired and the appointment of its successor, we need speed and dispatch in the work of the Judicial Service Commission. After all, it is the members of the judiciary themselves who lamented publicly about the vacancies which permeate the institution. And therefore, it is expected that the GSC will proceed with alacrity in addressing these vacancies. Borbis has been without a land court judge for the longest while. And that void needs to be filled as early as is possible. And there are numerous vacancies in the magistracy, no doubt in the High Court, and in the Court of Appeal. It would be recalled that we amended the Court of Appeal Act to increase the complement from, I believe, five to nine. The Court of Appeal only has three judges. So you have six vacancies right there in the Court of Appeal. In 20. 13, we increased the complement of high court judges from 12 to 20. So you have a number of vacancies in the high court as well. So a lot of work has to be done, and it has to be done with dispatch. Hopefully, the Judicial Service Commission appreciates the monumental task that with which they are shouldered. I am looking at the comments to see whether I can address. Someone is calling for a movement of the retirement age from 55 to 60 years. That's something that government will have to cogitate upon. It's not something that is new. And I suppose government will have to look at that carefully and determine a way forward. So. I see that Mr. Nigel Hughes has responded to my statements regarding supermajority and continues to argue 
that we need super majorities for, for our constitution and for decision making in government. And I continue to maintain that in Guyana, super majorities will be a recipe for gridlock and deadlock. As we see clearly from the provisions of the Constitution that require the President and the Leader of the Opposition to agree on the appointment of the Chancellor and the Chief Justice of the country. An appointment has never been made to either of those two offices since the Constitution was changed some 23 years ago. And therein lies the evidence supporting my contention. Mr. Hughes decided to look at Suriname as the basis for his contention that other countries have supermajorities. First of all, Suriname has a completely different constitutional and legal structure from ours. I would have hoped that Mr. Hughes would have pointed me in the Commonwealth where we have a similar legal system or with whom we have a similar legal system and similar legal history. So we have 50 countries in the Commonwealth. We have about 13 or 14 right here in the Caribbean. Mr. Hughes chooses a Dutch system to look at a system that is completely alien to our constitutional system, structure, and history. So that's the first point. But secondly, the arguments that he advanced support exactly what I'm saying. Because the Suriname Constitution speaks to a decision-making process that requires a simple majority. That's similar to ours. We make decisions in our National Assembly largely by simple majorities. Then he points to a series of provisions in the Suriname Constitution, about four of them, where super, majority, super majorities are required. But if one looks at Guyana's Article 164, and all of you can go to Guyana Constitution and look at Article 164, it's what the constitutional lawyers and students will call the entrenched provisions. Article 164 lists over a hundred provisions of our constitution that can only be changed by a supermajority, two-thirds or referendum. Over 100 provisions of our constitution can only be changed by two-thirds majority or by referendum. Over 100. He cites four in Suriname to support his argument. And I am citing 100, that we have over 100 provisions in Guyana that require that type of majority that he's calling for. So I, I, I don't, many people have asked me to write in response. I, 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 I don't understand. His argument is self-defeating. His argument is implosive. The argument as a support is what he wants to articulate. Then I saw Mr. G.H.K. Lal writing a whole long article today I suppose criticizing me because according to him I am opposed to consensus or I am opposed to, a, to consensus decision making. I am not opposed to consensus um, decision making and I know if I created that impression well then I wish to recant and I don't think that I said anything that would lend to the inference 
that I am against consensual and consensus decision making. In fact, I support consensus and consensual decision making. But is that possible in Guyana? Is it possible anywhere else? On important matters in a society where you have heavy, divisive politics and polarization. I am speaking in the context of the realities and exigencies of Guyana. That's where I'm situating my, 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 my contentions. I am not speaking abstractly, and I'm not speaking for a utopian scenario. I am dealing with the pragmatic realities of the Guyanese society with all its idiosyncrasies. That's what I'm speaking about, Mr. Lal. I'm not speaking about a utopia or some, some, some society that exists somewhere else. I am speaking about the realities of this country. I have lived here my entire life. And one thing I know, I know the politics and sociology of this society. I know it. I may not be as old as many people. I may not be as young as many people. But I believe that I have a fair understanding of the history of this society, the politics of this society, the realities of this society. And whenever I speak, I speak in the context of those realities. I don't speak to a society in space. So let me see if I have any comment, any question. Somebody cussing up the Kaicho news. Well, I'm not going to get involved in that. Anyway, let's continue. So, our government has a very aggressive legislative agenda, as you would recognize. For the first half of this year, we have already and acted in our parliament, by our parliament, 20 pieces of legislation. That is another record. For this year, we have enacted 20 pieces of legislation, and we have just concluded the first half of our parliamentary year. We, September, uh, November, uh, October, we will go into the second half. And we are passing very modern laws as well as very complex laws. And it is imperative that our society, in particular, the ordinary citizen, the policemen who are required, the policemen who are required to enforce the law, the judiciary who are to interpret the law, and, import, and other important stakeholders. It is imperative that they understand the law. And we are moving at such a pace that cabinet has formed the view that we need to 
start a, an aggressive public awareness program to sensitize our population on the laws that we are passing. So that first of all, they understand how they can benefit from these laws. These laws are not being passed because our government wishes to pass law. Each one of these pieces of legislation is intended and designed to improve the lives and livelihood of our people. There's no other objective inspiring these laws. They are, at the end of the day, when you strip them of their technical, esoteric, and other contents, the laws are all designed to benefit the people of our country. So that's the first thing, and they must be told in the simplest of language how each piece of law, each piece of legislation will benefit them. And secondly, we must go through the provisions of the law so that they understand the offenses as well which are being created because ignorance of the law is not a defense. If you don't know the law, then how will you be expected to obey the law? And it is impossible to expect the ordinary citizen to find the laws and read them. It is almost impossible to expect also that the ordinary policeman and woman will understand, will find the laws, read them, and understand them. I mean, that's a, an inconvenient reality to accept, but it is a reality. So we have to launch an aggressive, and direct public awareness campaign in a diversified way, targeting the various sectors, including the public, in ensuring that the law is simplified, that these bills are explained, that their benefits are highlighted, that the people whom these laws are intended to benefit, understand how, and that the offenses are made known to them so that they will avoid committing them. This can't be a singular initiative. It has to be a multifaceted approach. But the Ministry of Legal Affairs will begin the process because we have possibly the largest number of lawyers assembled in the country in one place under one institutional apparatus. And most importantly, the laws are drafted at the AG office. And we will lead in a process, we will launch a TV program called Simplifying the Law, and we will begin from there. But it will include all ministers, it will include police officers, it will include legal, other legal officers, Officers from the DPP chambers, officers from the various state agencies, legal officers, and more importantly, it will include the private bar in discussions as well. So we will have different panels discussing different pieces of legislation 
that we are passing in our efforts to bring public awareness to this slew of laws that we are enacting in our legislative agenda. As I said, members of parliament will participate. They will be invited. Lawyers from the AG office, magistrates, judges if they wish to come, but they may not want to come. But certainly lawyers in the state apparatus. And we will try to engage members of the private bar. We will engage important stakeholders like the public private sector commission, the labor movement, religious organizations, the um, Georgetown Chamber of Commerce, and different stakeholders to participate in these discussions so that the discussions are lively and they are interesting and they are edifying, most of all. So that initiative will begin, I believe, from next week. And hopefully, it picks up and we get the cooperation of, of, um, of, of, of others. Because as I said, it's an initiative of the Ministry of Legal Affairs, but it is intended to embrace a large number of persons. And it's a decision that cabinet made because of the number of legislation that we are passing. We need to bring our population up to speed with them. My attention was drawn to a statement made by Mr. Aubrey Norton that the next coalition government will compensate victims of PPP discrimination and victimization. Could you believe this guy? Norton says that the next coalition government will compensate victims of PPP discrimination and victimization. Firstly, I don't know when that coalition government will be elected. Secondly, it is doubtful that Norton will be anywhere close to when a new coalition government will be elected. And thirdly, compensate what victims of PPP discrimination and victimization? What victims you're speaking about? Norton, as I've said before, has simply decided that he will look at what the PPP did while we were in the opposition and he will copycat. He will copy and mimic exactly what we did in opposition from 2015 to 2020. Obviously, he recognized that what we did was effective and we were able to regain government. So Norton is traveling that same road. The difference is that we had the actual basis. We had the factual basis upon which we could have launched the programs that we did and the political activism that we actually launched. Where will he find the victims of PPP discrimination? Where? We have asked them already. They said that we discriminate on the school grant. And I have said to them that the school grant is constructed, the program, the, the, the beneficiaries are derived from the registers in the school. And they're all public servants who are running that cash grant program. 80% of them are afro guyanese Are you telling me that they will sit down and take instructions to disenfranchise afro guyanese thousands of them from the cash grant program? That's what you're, that's your narrative? And we have said before, and I repeat again, bring the people who are being discriminated against. 
They said the COVID grant. The co we discriminated against. I've asked them, I said, bring one Afro Guyanese. Put them on camera. Put them on camera. Put them on Facebook. Let us see who qualified for the COVID grant and didn't get it. They can't do it, but they keep talking to themselves. And victimization. Where is this victimization? Who were victimized? The people, the squatters we removed, that's victimization. If we want to build a highway and we remove squatters, that's what they're calling this victimization. So, Mr. Norton, we are flattered that you are seeking to emulate us while we were in the opposition. The difference is we had real cases. We had 1,900 Amerindians whom you dismissed in one day. 1,900 Amerindians you dismissed in one day. We had 7,000 or more sugar workers whom you dismissed in, in about a couple of weeks. We had rice farmers who couldn't go back to the lands because you raised the rates, the rents, and the DNI charges by 1,500%. We had hundreds and thousands of rice farmers who couldn't go back to the land. We had 50 families, afro guyanese families, from whom you took away lands at MMA, and you, want, you gave them to your supporters. We took them to court and we won all the cases. We have... People that you, you took away the, the, the VAT, you took away the, the, the water from pensions, pensioners. You took away the school grant from the school kids. You imposed 200 taxes on the backs of the Guyanese people. You took away forestry concessions from investors. You send the GRA after the businessmen. You send Soku and Sara after the businessmen. Raiding their house in the night. You send GRA to audit the cash crop farmers to see how much bank of Baji and Bora and Balaji they planting. That is what you did. So we had a basis. We had thousands of people who were victimized. And thousands of people who are discriminated. This, what you are trying to do here, is a bluff that has no basis in fact or in reality. This here is just political rhetoric. Political rhetoric that you are spewing, hoping that somebody can pick it up. It has no basis in reality, my friend. Anyway, we have already passed program time. I want to thank you very much for staying with me for the past hour or so. We have covered a number of very important issues. And I want to, again, wish you a very good evening and invite you to join me next week as we continue our discussions with another program of issues in the news. It has been a pleasure speaking with you for the past hour or so. Thank you very much. Good night and goodbye.